And here we are with another uh, episode of Occupy Interview. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, today our guest is Jacob. Uh, uh, God, you just told me how to pronounce uh, Remus. Dr. Remus. Yes, Jason and Remus, right? he, he is a mentor and assistant professor of public affairs at SUNY Empire State College. And uh, he's here to talk to us about uh, uh, May Day, the Occupy movement. And uh, uh, Terry, why don't you go ahead and start us off? I think you had uh, a particular question to uh, kind of get the ball rolling. Through okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hey, hello. I'm, is my, <laughs> I hit my car right. switch. Am I back on yet? Oh yeah, you're on. You're on. Okay, we'll keep going here. <laughs> James was trying to get in touch with me on cell phone, so I was trying to figure out what happened. I don't. He seems to have dropped out, so I guess I've got to pull him back in. Uh, technical difficulties. Oh, don't we love live radio? Uh, <laughs> To, uh, to our listeners, there's not going to be a live stream today, more technical difficulties, uh, so we won't be able to take live questions, uh, regrettably. Our guest again is Dr. Jacob Remus, and uh, could you, uh, what, the, the university, could you introduce yourself in the university, please? Yeah, absolutely. I, I teach at SUNY Empire State College. That's uh, the State University of New York's adult education school. Great. I teach uh, public affairs and history and um, sort of a whole bunch of other things. All right. Well, let me get the ball rolling here. With uh, We kind of started off with uh, an article. One of our Occupy America members is uh, uh, Mike Rivera with What Really Happened. And he ran an article last week uh, that CNN has finally fessed up that we have 82 million hidden unemployed. Uh, so basically, he was saying when you f act, when you add those figures in, and his math looked pretty viable to me, we're looking at something like 45 percent of people are out of work. Um, those com we, if you compare that with figures, and and uh, we've got a link up that you'd sent me on basic figures from the quote unquote Great Depression, uh, they were basically saying about 25 percent. So basically. We're looking at an economic disaster here, uh, and 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 the way we see Occupy is a response to that disaster. That people are spontaneously responding. Um, your doctoral thesis was on disaster response, so it'd be love to hear uh, what you think Occupy people should know about disaster response. Yeah, so I, I guess the first thing I would say is that I'm not an economist. And don't have uh, ha have no particular knowledge about unemployment rates or or, or things like that. Uh, with it, one thing I would say is that the what we talk about when we talk about unemployment means a lot of different things. And as as we know, unemployment uh, when we talk about sort of the the official government statistics, it's talking about unemployment as a as a proportion of what we call the labor force, which is people who want to be employed are capable of being employed and they're actively seeking to be employed. And then we have um, a larger number which are who are people who have dropped out of the labor force because they've gotten discouraged. Well, we have still larger number and we talk about people who are um, underemployed, which is to say that they are working part-time but would like to be working full-time, uh, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that we talk about when we talk about uh, the Great Depression, we talk about that really high 25% rate is what that does politically and socially, right? That when we when we have an unemployment rate that's maybe 10% or, or 7 or 8%, it means that um, there is unemployment. We know that there's unemployment, but for most people, for 90% of the population, it doesn't affect them. Um, and it means that you're less likely to see people who are unemployed, not see people on the street, but, but see people in your life who are unemployed. Uh, one of the things when you get a really high unemployment rate that we, again, this is something we talk about when we talk about the depression, is how it really changes American culture and society for people to know a lot of unemployed people, to people to see unemployment is coming for them next. Um, now, if this, uh, to the extent that this 25%, or this 45% number is, is 
accurate or make sense, I think we are seeing something similar, that people are more aware of unemployment, that people are more afraid of unemployment, that people know their cousins, their friends, their neighbors uh, who are unemployed. And I think one of the things we see in Occupy is that it's actually much more than just a response to unemployment, that that, that is true about unemployment. It is also true about foreclosure, uh, that people know uh, have friends, have relatives, have neighbors who are losing their houses. It is true for the student debt crisis that people who um, might have otherwise imagined themselves to be um, sort of safe from economic catastrophe are seeing their friends, their relatives, their neighbors drowning under uh, student debt that can't be discharged uh, through bankruptcy even. Um, and so I think we see this in many ways. We are seeing a sort of precariousness, an economic precariousness that is affecting greater and greater numbers of people and more and more types of people. Um, one of the, again, one of the things that, that social scientists talk about is, is this concept of homophily. That means that uh, people who are alike tend to cluster together. And when we say alike, we mean a lot of different things. So there's homophily about race. There's homophily about class. That means that as a middle class white person, the people who I know best, the people who I know are likely to be other middle class white people. Uh, to some extent, this is sort of a something that we, we know intuitively. Um, but having all of these different kinds of economic crises, unemployment, foreclosure, student debt, um, it means that lots of different people are going to have in their social networks these economic crises, right? So I may not know anybody who um, is being foreclosed on, but I do know people who are drowning in student debt. Or I might not know people who have a lot of student debt because I might not be someone who has a lot of college-educated friends, but I know people who are being foreclosed on. Or... I don't even have that. Uh, say, I don't. My friends don't never owned houses and didn't go to college, but I know people who are unemployed, right? So this is a way that um, the, the 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 confluence of all of these problems and the the great extent of all these problems is a way that this is coming into people's lives and people's experiences um, in a lot of different ways. And I think that's why we are seeing um, why we are seeing Occupy, why we are seeing. Um, a lot of different um, facets of Occupy, and we're seeing uh, organizing on college campuses, we're seeing organizing um, on the streets, we're seeing organizing in workplaces. Um, you asked about about disaster relief, um, and again, to go back to the Depression, one of the um, one of the things to think about is how what happens in the Depression, what happens in the New Deal, is a great expansion of what we call the social safety net, essentially of what we expect as citizens. Uh, before the Depression, essentially there were poor people who, if they were the worthy poor, which is to say if they sort of tried, tried working, if they um, were seen as worthy in a variety of culturally specific ways, then they could get help, not on the basis that Everyone should get help, not on the basis that they deserved help, but on the basis of charity, on the basis that nice people were going to give them help out of the kindness of their hearts. Uh, one of the – what disasters do is it, they change that calculus. They uh, – when everybody's house is burned down, say, or an entire town is flooded, um, everybody is seen as worthy. Uh, there's a much greater willingness to uh, to help people to give money, and you see that both in charity that that throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries there are a series of disasters and and people from far and wide give money voluntarily through charity, but also governmentally. So, for instance, in 1914 is is uh, the first the first instance is a fire in Salem, Massachusetts, and um, 18,000 people are left homeless or jobless. And the federal government responds by appropriating $200,000 and sending um, an official with the army to go and give this money out. Not because, uh, not because the people in Salem are particularly worthy 
uh, because they sort of had a particularly um, or not and not because uh, they felt particularly bad for them, but because as citizens of the United States, as Americans, they deserved this help. Uh, this then gets expanded. It gets expanded particularly again um, in a flood on the Mississippi River um, in the 20s where, again, the army takes a big role in it. And then it gets expanded again in the 30s where the, the terminology of a disaster uh, to talk about the Depression is used as a way of saying we need to be doing this. We've, we've done disasters before, and now we need to do this new kind of disaster, this different kind of disaster again, and help people who are victims of a disaster um, Call, essentially calling an economic disaster something similar to a sort of disaster um, that – like a fire or a flood. Does that, does that sort of begin to answer your question? Well, I think we lose you, Terry. <laughs> I think I'm back in again. I, I was wondering – did you have a response to that, Mark Lark? Uh, no, I, I, I don't have any questions at the moment, uh, but uh, he, he had asked if that had answered your question, or... Uh, I, we, uh, we had had a chance to talk to uh, Dr. John McCormick up at the University of Chicago uh, last week, and uh, he was basically, his show was on Machiavelli which the surprising part to me, and, and I'm embarrassed to have to say I should have known this, but I needed to be reminded uh, that, that Machiavelli was very interested in democracy, the power of democracy, and uh, even more than representative government. Uh, and, and our exit question with Dr. McCormick was if uh, Machiavelli was still alive, what did he feel would be his advice for the Occupy movement, how do we take back power? Uh, and his response was, and basically I'm paraphrasing here, uh, but but the uh, the powers that be are not going to give any power up out of the goodness of their heart. That anything, uh, according to Machiavelli, that that we achieve is something that we're going to have to take back actively. Um, and and since the uh, the labor history is uh, part of your expertise. Uh, I was wondering whether you had uh, any thoughts on that. Well, I think that's absolutely right. I think that what the history of this country and other countries show is that um, how, is that we, we make gains, we change political systems, we, get, we build power through building power, through organizing, through demanding, through uh, fighting, um, not th or very rarely through calls to conscience, and even the calls the con to conscience that are um, that are successful, they are successful because we're building power, right? So, so people often want to point to uh, the classical civil rights movement as an example of of a, a call to conscience. The, um, but even but even there. Um, the black freedom struggle, it was a struggle. It was organizing. It was demanding things. It was it, – it severely threatened the economic and political system of the United States and changed it. Um, and the, the Jim Crow did not fall out of the goodness of people's hearts. It fell because – of organizing and fighting and demands and embarrassment, right? So there's a there's a um, there's a, a growing field of literature about uh, there's a book called Cold War Civil Rights, right? So yes, there was a yes, there was embarrassment. There was embarrassment of the United States that in the 1960s, as we were sort of um, trying to get dominant or struggling back and forth with the Soviet Union about who would dominate newly decode. Uh, uh, decolonialized countries, it looked really bad in the, for the United States to be subjugating a large portion of its own population. Um, so in some ways, that's a call to conscience. In some ways, that is demanding and building power. Um, one of the things about um, the labor movement is 
all of the things that we think of as basic rights, as basic things that we have be- because of American, as American workers, all of those things were fought for. Often they were they people died for them. Um, I mean, the, the eight hour day is is one of the most perfect examples. Literally, people fought and died to get the eight hour day. But that's true for other things. That's true for other contracts. Until the 1930s, if you wanted to join a union, you had to be prepared to fight for it. You had to be prepared to stand and picket in front of your workplace, not just to sort of as a symbolic picket, not just as a protest, not just sort of pace around a little bit, but literally block people from going into your workplace and taking your space. Um, and you had to be prepared to get beaten up. You had to get prepared to get shot at, right? It was a violent and um, dangerous position. People understood what they were fighting for, both employers and workers. Um, one of the things that has happened in the the post New Deal in the New Deal period and the, from the 30s on is that. Um, a lot of that has been taken away. We do have protections of the government. We do have protections of the law. Um, I don't want to be. I don't want to say that that's not a good thing. I I like that um, people have some protections, uh, decreasing, diminishing protections when they're trying to to organize a union. Um, but it's good. That, but but whatever they have is is good. It's better. It's better something than nothing. But it's also it has also meant that. Um, the labor movement has gotten institutionalized. It means that uh, the labor movement um, has has a different set of fears. Right? People are afraid of bankrupting their unions through injunctions. People um, people have to or people choose to stay within the kind the confines of legality, um, and and that's a and that's just a different way of thinking about things. If you if you don't have Essentially, before labor law, there were no confines of legality. That meant things were a lot more dangerous. It meant that, but it also meant that the struggle was much more obvious. Um, and I think we have to see, we have to notice that when we stop fighting, when we stop, uh, when we stop struggling, we start losing, and we start uh, going back uh, because the other side. Um, they never stop struggling. They never stop fighting. That's 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 the nature of of class. That um, employers are always trying to get the most out of their workers for the least amount of money. And again, um, that that dovetails perfectly uh, with what what Machiavelli, uh, four hundred years ago, uh, five hundred years ago, uh, was saying that basically this is a continuing struggle. Um, I, I really found it interesting what you were just talking about about there has been there had been advances with labor law uh, but there have also been setbacks with labor law there was a call on May Day and I, I want to get back to May Day here uh, in a little bit because you did a really good article on it but, but hold that thought just a second <laughs> uh, May Day was a call for a general strike um, there have been two calls for general strikes and there's a link up uh, that talks about that was a what what I per- personally see as a response to trying to get the lawlessness dialed back uh, on the parts of the powers that be, and a successful attempt that the level of violence has been driven back uh, after the ports were shut down not once but twice out on the west coast. Uh, this time there was a general strike again that was called for. Uh, kind of mixed results on that this time. Um, and, and one of the factors in labor law here is Taft-Hartley. It's actually illegal to have a general strike. Is that correct? Yeah, but the thing is, it's always been illegal to have a general strike. Right? You think about the general strikes that we herald as sort of the, these major moments in American labor history. When we think about uh, 1877, when there was a general strike uh, that spread from West Virginia across the rail lines, um, pro, uh, labor People t- essentially took over Pittsburgh, took over St. Louis. Um, massive nationwide general strike. How did it end? It ended when President Hayes sent out the army and crushed it. Uh, 18, 1886, when there was a, a general strike in Chicago to demand the eight-hour day. How did that end? That ended with the police crushing it. Um, 
how did the 19, uh, 19 uh, Seattle general strike end? Same way, right? Um, general strikes are... Um, it's not that, there, that, that before Taft-Hartley, general strikes were legal, and therefore people did them all the time and they were easy. It's that our question of what legal meant was different. So, so one of the things that, that the Wagner Act does, the, the, the um, National Labor Relations Act, it's the, the, the law that, um, that, is sort of, that is the basis of, of our labor law now, it set up unions as normal. It actually it, it sets the, the, the policy of the United States under the National Labor Relations Act is to encourage collective bargaining and to encourage collective bargaining because it makes capitalism safer, because it makes capitalism easier. Um, it's very explicit. Um, it says it has been the is that it has been the experience is the finding of Congress that I'm I'm paraphrasing here, but that um, with that collective bargaining helps to tame the business cycle. It helps to regularize things. It helps to avoid disruptions because of fighting between management and labor. Uh, and so it's the policy of the United States to encourage it. And here's how we're going to encourage it. And they encourage it by establishing a bureaucracy so that rather than before the before the NLRA. Um, when a union um, wanted to be recognized by the employer, it would often have to go on strike or it have to threaten to go on strike. And they would say, OK, you have to recognize us. You have to deal with us. You have to bargain with us. What um, the Wagner Act did was people no longer had to do that. They could then go to the government and say, we want an election to elect us to be the union. Uh, then there would be an election. Uh, there would be this this back and forth between the, the management and labor, uh, the management and unions, rather. And then the government would say, okay, we are going to recognize and certify this union. Um, that just changes the whole way that unions think about risk. It changes the whole way about that workers think about risk. Um, and you see a massive increase in organization, without question. Then it, with the Taft-Hartley Act in 1948, you get um, a lot of that ripped out from under unions. So you get restrictions on um, what we call secondary strikes and secondary boycotts. So you can no longer strike. Uh, so if a, if, a, if a factory is on strike and the widgets that they are selling, that, that the factory is making, um, is uh, are what we call hot, are, are made by scabs, um, you can't now, under Taft-Hartley, you can't mount a picket line around the store that is selling those widgets. That's a secondary boycott. Um, if you are a janitor, if you're a unionized janitor and you're on strike against the janitorial services company, you can't mount a picket line at the front of the building that you clean because that's picketing the, the customer of your employer. It's not picketing your, cust your employer itself. <laughs> um, so you get so absolutely Taft Hartley diminishes, and so that and that's essentially what people talk about when we say that that um, general strikes are are illegal. What that is saying is uh, the secondary strikes, secondary boycotts are illegal. You you can only strike the organization with whom you have your primary complaint. Essentially, I've, um, I've been a, a labor movement supporter my my entire life. Um, I found it interesting. When the two port shut the two port shutdowns happened last year, uh, the basically there was a a fairly clear divide between rank and file, who seem to be thinking that Occupy is, is a really good thing for the labor movement. I, I, the numbers are really down on organized labor, and I'm sure you know that number better than I do. Uh, and and the actual leadership uh, of of the labor movement that were somewhat softer in their support and part of it was because they were saying Taft Hartley was making it difficult for them to support the general strike and again the general strike is important going back to what uh, the the, the uh, Machiavelli was saying the response that actually was an effective uh, power uh, tactic was to actually remove yourselves which is kind of what a strike is all about. Um, can you respond to yeah, that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what a strike is about, right? Uh, so, well, so I, I, there were two parts of that. I'll, I'll, I'll do the, the first one first, which about the, um, uh, 
labor movement, sort of institutional labor movement. And one thing I would say in particular about what leaders are saying is they have to be really careful, right? They have a essentially a fiduciary duty to their members, to their treasuries, to their buildings, right? They can't say things publicly that are going to uh, potentially bankrupt their unions. Um, what they say privately, what they're saying to their members, what they're saying to their organizers um, may or may not be a different thing. Um, there's a um, – and the, the other thing is that the particularly the port shut down. Uh, the, the Longshore Workers Union, which is the West Coast Longshore Workers, ILWU, um, is – among the best unions in the country, so mo- among the most militant, among the most willing to break the law, among the wo- most willing, um, among the most willing to be political in their in their actions, as in sort of not to just talk about the the money they the, their wages or their conditions, but to do other things. They they had a shut down, They had a strike to protest the Iraq War. They they routinely refuse to unload ships that come from. Um, um, countries that they don't want to be doing business with they are uh, really a a union to emulate and one of the things that they did it was work together with occupy um to they uh so so there was a, a fight that um that the ilwu was having with a portland um grain uh grain company egt uh, a port company uh that it's complicated. It was a jurisdictional fight between between the Longshore Workers Union and another union. But essentially, this grain operator wanted to open the first facility on the West Coast that was not going to be a Longshore Workers Union facility. And they broke the law. They went in and they, they poured grain on the floor. They sat on the railroad tracks. They put themselves on the line. They put their bodies on the line. And they put their union on the line and really caused havoc. And they did that for really as long as they could. They did they did that in the face of um, threats of jail. They did that the, the threat the, in the face of threats of uh, bankrupting their union. It was really risky. And then when they sort of had exhausted that, when they went as far as they could go, Occupy was able to step in because Occupy doesn't have any of these rules, right? I mean, Occupy doesn't have the rules about who they can who they can pick in, who they can't. Occupy has shown itself perfectly willing to, to some parts of Occupy. Some people have been shown themselves perfectly willing to break laws. And there's no treasury, there's no institution that people can go after. Um, so so I think um, the EGT fight that the, that the longshoremen have is actually a really good example of where Occupy and labor can work together. Uh, there's a very good article um, that Josh Edelson uh, wrote about this. Um, about sort of how how Occupy and and the ILWU worked together on this fight. Uh, your other question about the importance of strikes and the um, where power from workers come from, I think, is spot on. Um, workers ha- have their power from withholding labor. Um, that's what a strike is. A strike is about withholding labor. That is. Um, what workers can do to to get their point across um if if they don't work the the capitalists who make money off of their labor aren't making money um and that goes to everything there's a there's a great line joe hill the great labor the great wobbly songwriter has a has a verse he says if the workers take a notion they can stop all speeding trains every ship upon the ocean they can tie with mighty chains every wheel in all creation every mine and every mill and the armies of all nations can at our command stand still right what that's saying is if if workers take a notion if they organize if they decide to do it everything will stop because in the end most people are workers soldiers are workers sailors are workers uh, everyone who works in all those mines and in, in, in every mine and every mill, they're workers. And if they stop, there's nothing more to there's nothing more to be said. The trick is organizing. The trick is making it so that everybody will stop. And that is hard. That is the hardest thing one can do. Um, but uh, but that is where the power of unions and where the power of workers comes from. Have you? Uh Throughout labor history, uh, a lot of people 
lot of people really are not all that aware of of how long and how crucial labor history has been. And again, the numbers are way down on organized labor. Uh, and, and this is something that's going to have to be, we're all going to have to be labor supporters. That is part of the Occupy movement's most important, um, one of the most important goals we can have here. But we're having problems in Occupy with infiltration. Uh, you touched on uh, some members associated with the Occupy movement, and, and I'd like to make that differentiation, uh, seem to be more willing to break the law than others and in different ways than others. Um, we've had a problem with infiltration uh, that, that there, are, there are instances where police officers have been caught uh, masquerading as black bloc or as Occupy people creating violence that then gives them, gives authorities an excuse for turning a nonviolent protest into a, a violent protest. Um, that's, that's a tactic that's been repeated over and over and over in labor. Can you address that? Yeah, I and mean, I want to push back against that a little bit. One I would say is that police don't need an excuse to be violent, right? <laughs> yes. We see this in lots of cases. We see this in lots of examples. We, see, we have seen this uh, where I am in New York over and over again, where there has not been a lot of property damage, and yet police have still been incredibly violent. Um, I, we saw this. Um, I, I came today from a, from a rally at Brooklyn College where um, that was a solidarity rally by, largely by faculty in support of students who on May 2nd had gone to their president's office, and the police came and beat up people and arrested two of them. Um, one of the people who was there had previously had both of her feet broken at a previous rally. Uh, right? Police don't police don't need the excuse to be violent. Police, um, and I say this in fact with with a great deal of respect for police. I, I teach a lot of police and people who who are in the in the um, process of becoming police. Uh, but police are violence. That is what police are there for. Police are state violence. Uh, Max Weber famously um, defined the state as the monopoly on the legitimate uh, use of violence. On That's one what the level, state is. At, on uh, another level, there are also peacekeepers. Yes, but they, but they are, um, but they keep the peace through the threat of violence. Okay, threat Arrest, of violence. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, uh, and the other thing I would, well, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and rather selectively, for that matter. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing I would, I would say about that is we have to be really careful about what we are calling violence. Yes. Um, that property destruction is not violence. Um, now, you can make a perfectly good argument, and an argument I, I may very well agree with, that property destruction is counterproductive, that it is stupid, that it, it, it hurts the cause. But I think we have to be careful and say what is violence is beating somebody. What is violence is dragging someone and putting them behind bars and keeping them in jail. What is violence is um, spraying, uh, spraying mace at somebody, spraying pepper spray at somebody, um, poisoning the air with tear gas. Those are violence because that is doing bodily, corporeal harm to somebody. Excellent um, point. Breaking a window – um, uh, smashing some furniture, um, spray painting a wall. Again, all of those things may or may not be bad. All of those things may or may not be counterproductive, but they're not violence. And if we allow that to be called violence, we've already given up too much. Okay, superb point. Uh, and, and maybe we need to bring this back to in 1775. Uh, there was property destruction of the East India Tea Company uh, when they threw the tea overboard as a protest, a tax protest, uh, the Boston Tea Party. Um, at least there was a tactical reason for being doing that as opposed to tactically, do we really want to be breaking windows? Um, and, and do you have any thoughts on that? I'm, I'm interested. Yeah, well, again, I think, I, mean, I, think, I think that people who escalate and who have um, who have um, 
the desire to, to who who are going to who are advocating property damage have an obligation to think about why they are doing it, to think about what the goals are, uh, and how it affects or doesn't affect the movement. Um, to take an example, um, there's a great book by a guy named Tim Tyson, who's a historian of the Black Freedom Struggle, uh, about uh, something that happened in his town when he was growing up in, in Oxford, North Carolina, when uh, a group of white men killed an African-American man uh, and in 1970. Um, so re- really rather late to be doing that with impunity. And in fact, they couldn't do it with impunity. But the government did nothing. The white power structure did nothing. And so what uh, a group of African-American young men, many of whom were veterans, had come back from the Vietnam War, they destroyed a lot of property. They burned down tobacco warehouses. They smashed up downtown. And he has this great image of that he describes, Tyson does, of their headquarters, the, the sort of the headquarters of the essentially these rioters was a was a pool hall in in the black part of Oxford, and uh, he describes it as he says it was as if there's a cash register, and they're sitting there adding up all of the damage that they are doing, and they say what is going to make the whites listen to us? How much damage do we have to do? How much money do we have to cost them? And um, and it works. They cause enough damage to to get someone to pay attention to them. I think that's legitimate. I think, but I think it has to be thought out. I'm not. I I am not necessarily convinced that smashing windows of a Starbucks is the way to do it. But I'm not convinced. Yeah. I'm not necessarily convinced otherwise. I think that there are. I think there are good arguments. And I think people have to be thoughtful about it. I think people have to think about the dangers of it. The dangers to themselves, the dangers of others, the dangers of people who do not wish to participate in that kind of activity, and the dangers to the movement. Because what happens, because, because what we are still doing, we are still trying to build a movement, right? We are trying to um, build a movement. We're trying to get more and more popular support. And smashing things is not necessarily the way of getting more popular support. In fact, it may very well decrease popular support. Again, because of Asian provocateurs in the labor movement, and and I'm sure you've got a a long, uh, for exactly what you're addressing right now, that that it destroys popular support. Um, And that's why the Asian provocateurs historically have done that sort of thing, bad tactically. Uh, The Starbucks window is covered by insurance. It's not going to really achieve anything along the lines of, say, a port shutdown. Uh, another point that came to mind here, too, was that the, you were saying that the, uh, in, the, in the black civil rights movement, um, and I'll try and get links up. If you'll send us these links, we'll put these up with the Absolutely. archive version of the show. Uh, and I'll try and get the links up. There was a militia uh, movement by the blacks of veterans returning, and it with the threat of violence, but uh, very little or no violence helped create this, the, uh, the stoppage of violence against the blacks. Uh, I can't remember what the name of it is, but I'll find the link and put it up. Uh, yeah, can I, mean, you- I think so. So um, the way we often remember the black freedom struggle is king. It is um, uh, a very principled nonviolence. Um, if you've ever seen videos of non of the nonviolence trainings that um, CORE did, Congress of Racial Equality did, uh, in preparation for the the Freedom Rides, it's really quite extraordinary. It's really moving to watch the training. So it's essentially people who are um, sitting there just taking extraordinary abuse and mm-hmm. taking violence. And of course, we know with the with Freedom Rides and the Freedom Rides, people's bu- the buses were torched. They, were, they did face tremendous, remarkable violence. Um, Contrasted with Malcolm X and his position? Well, well, and that's what... So, so, exactly. And so then we also have the story about Malcolm X and about violence. And I think but one of the things that we miss is that these are not clear lines. There was armed self-defense all around. And um, 
there was violence and there was the threat of violence. And I think that we, um, I'm not a pacifist. I, uh, I think sometimes that violence is appropriate. Um, I think it has to be thought, real, both, both real violence, both sort of corporeal violence and also what, what some, what we often incorrectly call violence of, of property damage. I sometimes think that's, I am not someone who's going to, to, um, say that that is, is always a terrible thing. But again, I think it has to be well thought out. I think it has to be not just a sort of a macho display of I'm tough and I want to break some stuff. And it certainly um, shouldn't be an agent provocateur. Well, making it exactly. A, exactly. And, and, and that seems well, to be, in the Occupy movement, there seems to be an ongoing discussion. Chris Hedges, uh, Cancer and Occupy, and we've had guests address this. Uh, we do have a problem. We are losing popular support um, because of the infiltration, which I agree, you don't need the infiltration to give the police an excuse to go off the deep end. However, by the same token, there are also police there who are oath keepers. They have taken an oath, especially if they're ex-military, uh, to support the Constitution. There were places, Philadelphia, where the police are siding with the Occupy movement against illegal suppression, nonviolently. Um, I guess what I'm looking for here is, and, and we're all, all over the Occupy movement, we're looking for what are the answers here to get us past this? Um, right. Well, I don't, I don't have answers. I guess what I have are, as a historian, what I have are stories from past movements and ways that we can understand things. One of the things that really worries me when we start talking about infiltrators is when we think about COINTELPRO, the, the counterintelligence program, the, mm -hmm. the program of infiltration and uh, disruption that the new left faced in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, not only were organizations infiltrated and was, was that bad and there were agents provocateur, but part of the damage of infiltration is the fear of infiltration. That if you start infiltrating and people know, and, and you start getting afraid of who's the police infiltrator and who isn't, then you all of a sudden lose your ability to trust your colleagues and your comrades in the movement. And there's a really fine line to walk that, that I, don't have, I do not claim to have a, an answer to, but there's a really fine line to walk of how do we protect ourselves against infiltrators and agents provocateur. And compared to, on the other side, how do we not get so wrapped up in being afraid of infiltrators and agents provocateur that we all of a sudden don't trust people? That is what, the, of, all, of all of the... the ways that, that police repression destroyed the Black Panther Party, one of the really key ways was by making it so that they couldn't trust each other anymore. They were constantly afraid of who was, who was an infiltrator, or who was real, who wasn't. Um, and it tore the movement apart. Uh, and that was the goal, right? The goal was the movement being torn apart. So, But on uh, the overall historic pattern, the movement did win. Uh, 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 the Black Party didn't win. Uh, the Black Panther Party didn't win, rather. We, uh, uh, but we do have a black who's a president who wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been a possibility of that happening had not that black power movement had happened. Is another way of, I'm not, that's another way of looking at it. Overall, the tactics were effective against black power. However, in the long run, we do have a black for president, as, as we should have. Ab um, ab absolutely. I don't want to diminish the, the successes of uh, the civil rights movement, but um, but we also have to to recognize um, its limitations, where it did not succeed, the ways in which um, massive inequality and massive white supremacy remain, and in particular, we have to remember that the goal of the Black Panther Party was not um, civil rights, was not the black president of the United States. It was. Um, self-determination it was revolution um and that you know we might you i you we might say that's not our that's not our goal and to that extent um we may be happy that they didn't win but but they didn't win 
mean, there was not there was not a revolution. There was not self determination. Um, Good in point. Any sense. Excellent point. Uh, and and again, this is what why we're trying to reach out to, to people like you that have the background that can give us these historic. Um, what's the quote from? Uh, if, if you haven't studied history, you're doomed to repeat it. Exactly. Um, and I think and I think there's a there's a a danger to that also, and I don't I don't want to sort of be the sage who knows things because history. Uh, um, one of my one of my teachers once once used the phrase history doesn't teach us things; historians teach us things. Um, that that there's only a limited sense in which history has lessons. We can learn we can learn from history. We can get ideas from history. We can see what's happened in the past. We can be inspired by things that happened in the past. Um, but um, but it is but it's also true that we are in our own moment and we have to build our own um, our own movement that that responds to the demands and the needs and the structures of today. Um, How do you see the labor movement? Uh, and again, what the numbers are in single digits. Some of them I've seen for actual organized. Yeah, I believe it's seven percent now for uh, the private sector, and around ten percent for all workers. As a as a as a union movement supporter, I find that appalling, and I find that to be a main main contributing factor to why we have to have people being beat up in the streets right now, from one end of the country to the other, and from one end of the world to the other. Uh, I, I think also that we are winning. Uh, that we are taking back that power like Machiavelli uh, was recommending. And can you, do you have any thoughts on, uh, there's an article link that will be up on uh, a Forbes article on uh, in Germany, um, the difference between the, the labor movement in Germany and the labor movement in here in the States. Uh, but basically they build uh, twice as many cars, twice as much money, for the individual labor people, I think I'm messing this up. Can you can you jump in and rescue me here, Doc? Yeah. Uh, yeah so basically, essentially, um, well, the article that that you're going to post was is about sort of the different way in which the the political economy of Germany and the United States are structured. Right, that that Germany has um, higher union density rates, but also um, these various structures that uh, legally that force employers to um, to to talk with and uh, to talk with unions and to get um, and to work with them sort of before the the point of a strike or before the point of real confrontation um, the United States obviously doesn't have that the United States has has lower and declining den union density rates um, I mean again I think there are there are multiple parts to this. One is um, one is that, that capitalism looks different in different cultures. There is no one pure capitalism. Uh, there's no uh, we we talk about the market as if the market is is without values, without um, specificity, without culture, and that's not true. There's a there's a there's a large body of sociological literature of sociology of, of Capitalism, the sociology, uh, uh, economic sociology is the is a broader field about varieties of capitalism, um, right? And we can think about this. In every every market is structured by um, is structured by society, structured by people, um, and uh, and there's a a way in which. Um, in which we have to answer very basic questions, right? So the very first question you have to ask when you're structuring a market is, can we own people? It, which is, say, is slavery allowed? Um, we have a moral answer to that, but there's no obvious answer when you're structuring a market. Why shouldn't we be able to own people? Um, should you able, be able to own land? Should you be able to rent out money, which is to say to charge interest? Um, from those things, there is lots and lots of different forms of capitalism and Germany has a different form than we have. Um, and we're often sort of inclined to say 
the American system is the most capitalist, whether we think that is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but I think we need to move away from that sort of most to least way of thinking about it and thinking about it as just different varieties. So that's, that's the, that's the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing I would say about union density and union power is that, um, it's not, um, well, they're not, they don't strictly correlate, uh, France, which actually has a tremendous amount of union power, um, actually does not have a particularly high union density, and they sort of extend their power in other ways. That they, that they negotiate conditions and they set policies for people who are not members. Um, but but the the broader point I would make is is twofold. Um, you keep calling yourself a labor supporter. Mm-hmm. Um, and by which I, I sort of gather what you mean is a supporter of the union movement. Yes. I've never uh, actually belonged to a union, uh, but I am a labor movement supporter. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I don't mean to pick on you, but I mean, but, but it's sort of it's, – it's telling that – and I and – I, I mean, actually, I am a member of a union now because, because my, I'm a state employee and, and um, – the professors at SUNY are members of a union, but before Good. this, I hadn't been a member. Before this, I had not been a member of a union, and I would have described myself the same way. But fundamentally, we have to think of ourselves not as um, not as supporters of the labor movement, but as workers ourselves. Okay. Um, if you get a paycheck, if you have a boss, you are a worker. Um, and that means that you should be working, building solidarity with your fellow workers, you, the people who have the same boss as you, the people who receive their paycheck from the same person or the same organization. Um, and um, that's the way we start to rethink what we are talking about when we talk about the labor movement. What's, what's important – I want, I want unions to have more members. Absolutely. Me too. But um, what's important – it's less important how many members uh, the affiliates of the AFL-CIO have as how many workers are banding together to demand th- – to collectively bargain and, com- and demand things from their bosses Great. or demand things from society or demand things from politicians. And I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, the what the labor movement has looked like has changed a lot over the past 150 years or so, right? We used to have um, the Knights of Labor in the 18, in the early 1880s. It was this organization. It was industrial unionism. It was people organized both by geography and by industry. It was interracial. It had women sometimes. Uh, in theory, anybody any worker could join except for saloon keepers. Um, <laughs> they did things. They did things like. Um, organized cooperatives they had this whole sort of union and worker culture um that's one form of unionism we had the 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 craft unions of the american federation of labor those were skilled workers they were exclusive they were white they were male um they built their power based on their skills and that if they stopped working people other people couldn't. Other people couldn't do their work um, because other people didn't know how to do their work. Um, other people wouldn't have done it as well. Um, so they were able to strictly control their working conditions, and they were able to control their their output. Um, and they did this through through organizing each other and through ideology and by making demands on on uh, employers. We had the industrial workers of the world, the the Wobblies, which was an industrial union which organized by industry. Um, which believed in sabotage, it believed in direct action, it believed in building um, power through unions um, through at the point of production that could then be expanded politically. We then, in the 1930s, we had the CIO, which um, organized um, industrially, it organized in factories. All of these things are very different models of how to organize, why to organize, who should organize, uh, who should be organized. Um, and they and they fit in with different moments of what um, the American economy looks like. So when we had um, so the 1930s, we had a different structure and type of union for a different type of worker. 
right? For industrial workers, the CIO looked different than the AFL did. Uh, now we're in a moment where increasingly uh, workers are doing service work, um, working in retail, working doing uh, doing work which is which has some sort of customer component to it. I think that's likely to look different again. I think it's that is going to look as different from um, 1930s style unions as 1930s style unions looked from 1880s style unions. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I think we need to be open to these new forms of to new forms of organizing. Um, really exciting things going on in worker centers. Really exciting things going on in um, things like the the freelancers union or like the um, a new organization for models, uh, which is not calling itself a union but is is very union like. Uh, new organizations uh, like the Restaurant Opportunity Center for um, for restaurant workers. Um, I think we have to new things like Occupy. I think we need to be really expansive and imaginative about how we are going to organize and not let ourselves get stuck. Learn from the past, but not let ourselves get stuck in uh, structures from the past. Outstanding, Mark. Did you have something here? Yes. Uh... I was wondering, in, in light of uh, things like the, uh, the port shutdowns were, uh, that was uh, originally called for by Occupy, and uh, the fact that uh, organized labor, the uh, membership is uh, down so much, its power has receded so much, uh, and since Occupy is uh, essentially designed to be a decentralized movement without a... Uh, a real uh, uh, structuralized uh, leadership. I don't see uh, organized labor as either uh, having the ability or the uh, the kudos these days to take a leadership role. Do you think there is a sense within the within the uh, within organized labor uh, that they can uh, or a willingness to actually uh, take a back seat and actually? Uh, follow the lead of Occupy? Uh, people think that there are um, certainly labor leaders who want to learn from Occupy, um, who are really inspired by it, who are really excited by it. I think that there are people who also are worried that um, a lot of people in Occupy don't really know how to organize, have, don't have a lot of experience organizing. Um, I think that there is a lot, so, among some people, there's certainly a lot of distrust um, uh, about democracy and who is speaking for whom. Um, that what does it mean when you call for a port shutdown, but the workers who will be shutting down the port don't take a vote and don't decide whether they want to do that, for instance. Hmm. Um, but um, so I think I think the answer is sort of is hmm. is both and all. Um, yes and no. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think right I, again. I think this is a really exciting time. I think that the people who I think uh, I don't know anybody. Who is in the labor? Who, who works in the labor movement? Mm. Who does not know, or who does not think that the labor movement is in trouble, uh, and who is not actively I, and seriously looking for new models and um, new ways, new ways of doing things? And I think that absolutely, people are learning from um, people are learning from from Occupy. But on the other hand, I think they want it to be a two-way street, right? I think they want to say, right. we, um, we want some respect, too. Uh, and I think both sides are saying that. Okay, okay. Um, I, w I would like to mention in, in more regards to what you were saying earlier about uh, uh, actions having to be well thought out uh, uh, as opposed to... Uh, things like uh, randomly smashing uh, uh, windows of businesses and whatnot. Uh, I, I'd like to bring forth uh, 
an example that I've uh, uh, read of before. I'm afraid I can't really remember the uh, the name of the group or the uh, the business that was involved, but uh, the uh, story I read was basically uh, during the uh, uh, civil rights movement, and there was a certain uh, department store in uh, in a certain city that uh, basically did not hire blacks, mm. and uh, and long history of this. And so uh, this church group uh, from Black Church, of course, uh, got together and they, uh, they used the tactic of uh, all going in to shop at this uh, store at the same time uh, so that this uh, store was, you know, suddenly uh, uh, it had hundreds of uh, black people shopping in it and certainly they they'd never prevented black people from shopping there before. But uh, they went in and they uh, purchased, uh, you know, probably tens of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. And this department store had a uh, business model of a uh, no questions asked uh, return policy. And they would take, uh, the, uh, the policy was that you could send it back by mail and they would pay the postage on it. And so basically all of the goods that they purchased, they returned at the company's expense, which uh, was considerable considering about the quantity of merchandise. And uh, so essentially this is a, an example of, uh, of a tactic where you're costing, uh, you're, you're costing them money uh, a good deal of it, and it's done completely legally. And uh, I, I'm just wondering if you can uh, tell us of any other examples of kind of a creative within the uh, the bounds of uh, uh, you know creative protests like this within the bounds of the law can, that can really affect uh, you know somebody's bottom line. Um. I mean, there were lots of boycotts that are obviously within the, the bounds of the law. So um, a similar situation, actually, in uh, Durham, North Carolina, where, where white merchants wouldn't hire, uh, wouldn't hire African Americans. And there was a slogan, why shop where you can't work? Um, and, and so there was a, a very long boycott of, of downtown uh, white merchants in Durham, North Carolina. That was uh, perfectly legal. Um, and it had the, the desired effect. Um, they picketed. They, they encouraged people not to shop. Um, they did a lot of organizing, encouraging encouraging people not to shop there. Um, uh, the other thing, I mean, but... Um, but the other thing I, I would say is that a lot of times, a lot of times if you're trying to cost people money, you're going to have to cross a line about legality. And that doesn't necessarily mean cross a line to get about morality. But uh, I think about the, the sit-ins, uh, the famous, the famous sit-ins at lunch counters, right? Those, um, what those were essentially was denying the restaurants, the lunch counters, the ability to be making money. They would go in, they would sit there, and, um, they w and it would essentially shut down the restaurant. So for weeks on end, people would sit in, or a week, and it would shut down the restaurant. It would prevent people from making money. Now, um, I think we all we we all want to say that we support that, but it, I mean, they were arrested. Martin Luther King gave a, a famous right. speech in the at the beginning beginning few weeks of the of the um, sit-in movement, and he said, uh, "We will fill up the." J he gave the speech called the "Fill Up the Jail" speech. We will fill up the jails of the South. We are going to keep doing this, um, and. Uh, so, so again, I guess I, I'm not, um, I'm not convinced that staying within the bounds of the law is necessarily where we, where we should be, um, drawing our, um, right. Where we should be drawing nor, nor do, nor do I. I'm, I'm simply trying to, uh, uh, point out that there are creative, uh, ways that, uh, that you can affect the enemy's bottom line with without crossing that line on occasion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and if you really, yeah, and if, and if you really think about it, you can come up with creative ways to do that, uh, so that you know the only solution isn't uh, breaking a window, which is going to cost them, you know, what you know, a couple hundred bucks, and 
and end up spending three months in, in jail because of it, which seems like a rather lopsided uh, uh, way to do that <laughs> as far as a uh, cost-benefit analysis goes, you know. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> just to comment on uh, what you're saying about the lunch counter uh, uh, sit-ins, uh, essentially, uh, you know, yeah, when you're speaking of that, it kind of... Uh, I was kind of thinking about it. I was like, you know, that's that's kind of the uh, old school analog uh, version of the modern uh, uh, DOS attack, uh, the denial of server attacks, uh, denial of service attacks on the internet. <laughs> I, I think that is, that is exactly correct. I think that's a really good wow. analogy. Um, absolutely. Um, and I, and I think I mean I don't want to I, I I don't want to be in the position of sort of saying that we should be breaking the law for the sake of breaking the law. And you're absolutely right. That um, there are ways, that there are smart ways that we can be doing things from from within the law, from this side of legality, uh, and and what what it all depends on, what it all relies on, is organizing. Um, organizing is hard. Organizing is hard, and organizing is not particularly glamorous. And organizing is not just about going to rallies and marching in the streets. Uh, organizing is talking to our friends and to our neighbors and to our colleagues. Organizing is really listening. Organizing is building relationships um, and doing it over and over again. Um, and that is fundamentally what we need what we need to be doing. That, and that is one of the things that Occupy, I think, can really learn from, the labor, from parts of the labor movement, that there are unions, there are parts of the labor movement that really know how to organize, that do a really good job of it. Uh, there's a lot of labor movement that does not, um, but has techniques, has tactics, understands how to do it, knows how to build committees, knows how to build um, power in workplaces and in communities. And um, that's the work that we all need to be doing. Um, and, and I think that is how we're going to win. Um, and, that's, and that's where the power to do these other more, more, visible and more exciting actions are going to come from is going to be from the power and the relationships that we build through organizing. Right. Uh, Terry, it looks like we've uh, gone uh, to about an hour here now. Uh, do you have anything to uh, bring us home? Am I here? Terry? Yeah, you're here. Okay, sorry. I keep off, <laughs> off switch. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to bring it back to uh, May Day. I, I come from an aviation background. Uh, May Day to us means a distress call. <laughs> it comes from French, uh, supposedly, for help me. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw one picture out of the New York May Day uh, that had May Day, May Day, May Day, which really struck me because of my background. And to a degree, it did seem like uh, that's one interpretation of May Day. Another one, uh, we've got a link up. I didn't know that there was a, a, a connection with Robin Hood. And again, you'll see the link for it. Um, talking about uh, take from the rich, uh, give to the poor. Uh, I found that interesting. Uh, and, and it's in there. We'll also be adding the links in uh, that, that we've mentioned. But mainly, I, we started this off with you did a superb article reminding people why May Day is, uh, is an American institution. And I really wish you'd kind of touch base on that, if you would, Doc. I, I'm ashamed to say I had to be reminded. Well, absolutely. So, so May Day as a workers' holiday really does come from um, this very American movement, this very American moment in um, first the 1860s in um, – demanding an eight-hour day, uh, the short-hour movement, it was called, uh, as the next step in abolition, the next step in freedom. After the Civil War, after the freeing of slaves, it was um, workers, people who were paid, uh, who were free in that way, needed to have time for self-improvement, for leisure, for spending time with their family. Uh, that's what it meant to be a free man. Um, and there was a movement in the 1860s. It, it sort of fizzled out. Um, em, employers um, simply ignored the law. Um, and then in the 1880s, it, it comes rearing back in Chicago in 1886 um, 
Union say, all right, starting on May 1st, it's going to be an eight-hour day. Uh, and we're going to go on strike until there's an eight-hour day. Um, and they do that, and four days later, there's a, um, uh, a rally in a square called the Haymarket. Uh, somebody throws a bomb, police open fire, and um, lots, several people die, several people are injured, and then eight leaders of the uh, Chicago anarchist movement are arrested and charged with murder. Um, there's no evidence that any of them threw the bomb. There's no evidence that any of them made the bomb. There is good evidence that several of them would have made the bomb if they had had the opportunity. They're, they they were certainly people who advocated. There among those eight, there were certainly people who advocated bomb throwing and advocated violence, um, advocated revolution. Um, but uh, but a lot of them weren't even there that night. Um, it ends up really hurting the labor movement. But one of the things that it does uh, after after um, the the Haymarket martyrs are convicted, there's an international movement um, for clemency. And um, in fact, several of them got clemency. Several of them do not, and are killed. Uh, four of them are killed. One of them cheats the hangman by chewing a detonator cap. Um, but uh, and the others the others are eventually spared by the governor. And part of this movement, there were there were mass demonstrations in Paris and London, and people wrote to the ambassador, and people wrote to the governor. And uh, in 1890, there is this a a um, motion made for the um, in the Second International and in the the internationalist the international and internationalist socialist movement um, for a uh, for an international movement. That is um, uh, uh, international workers' holiday. So May first becomes the really the international workers' holiday to commemorate Haymarket, to demand the eight-hour day, to continue this agitation. Um, it's really dangerous in the United States. In fact, in the United States, there's already labor. Uh, the 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 September Labor Day that we are used to had already started. It was a Knights of Labor uh, holiday. Uh, the government really gloms onto that uh, as a way of defanging May first. Um, and May Day kind of disappears in the United States, and it's just abroad. And then in 2006, it comes rearing back because it comes rearing back as a day of an immigrant workers' day of action. People call it the day without the immigrant, and immigrant workers come out on the street, and there are hundreds of thousands of them, the largest labor demonstration ever in the history of the United States are immigrant workers, and it starts up this conversation about May Day again. So here's this American holiday uh, from an American movement crushed by the American police, uh, an American anarchist movement that starts it, um, disappears, and then sort of hibernates, uh, is kept care of uh, outside the country, and then is brought back by immigrants. And then this year, um, there, was this, there was this call for a, a May Day Day of Action um, by Occupy, American unions really for the first time embrace it. I marched in a um, in a march in New York City with about 30,000 people led by the Taxi Workers Alliance, an AFL-CIO member union. Um, I marched next to laborers and next to hotel workers. And um, it was really extraordinary to see the American labor movement celebrate coming back to this holiday, coming back to... Um, a May Day that um, we and our and our forebearers and our, um, if not literally, our our institutional forebears built. Uh, so, so it looks like we are going to occupy May Day then, and and we should. And I I really want to thank you for that article that you put out. It it uh, again, I I really felt myself embarrassed that I had to be reminded about that. But I was reminded about that, and uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Jake Remus. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add? Your book's not out. I'm really looking forward to your book. Uh, no. Uh, well, I would. I, I thank you very much. I, I hope to have it out in. Um, hope to have it out soonish, uh, probably in the next few years. Academic books take a long time. Um, one thing I would. One thing I would say, if people are interested in. Um, 
if people are interested in the uh, what, his, what labor historians are saying about the labor movement, about these sorts of questions, about what we can learn from historical uh, events, um, I do have a chapter in a book called Labor Rising, The Past and Future of Working People in America that is coming out uh, this month or so, uh, possibly next month from the New Press, uh, edited by Richard Greenwald and Daniel Katz. Um, and... Um, uh, they're short essays. They're short essays written for um, a broader public, and so people um, can can check that out if they want. Uh, do we? Uh, I, I really want to uh, thank you again for being with us, Doctor. Uh, thanks for standing. Uh, we uh, we want to remind listeners that uh, we want to thank Memford. Uh, he was our engineer, and. Uh, We'll be linking him. Uh, we've got a note for next time. We'll be linking it up, uh, simulcasting, hopefully. Uh, thanks again to Mark Lahr, uh, to James, who's there in the background, lurking somewhere. Um, that's about it for right now, and, and I, wanna, I, I just want to say thanks for standing. And well, thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.